A very pleasant good morning to everyone. I would like to acknowledge uh, Dr. Darren Conrad, Dr. Keith Nurse, Dr. Roxanne Brizan St. Martin, Ms. Halima Ali Sisbane, all part of the panel. Of course, Ms. Carla Bryan and all of the young presenters, Alexi Toussaint, Abijah Sincere, Jadon Kojo. A very pleasant good morning to each and every one of you. It is interesting that the youths of the nation are sitting to discuss the development of the Caribbean region as a result of the pandemic with a focus on challenges and opportunities. As Caribbean people, we have always been described by the parasitic colonizers as underdeveloped. Yet it is the very metropolitan superpowers that have been almost crippled by the pandemic. Great Britain and the United States of America have been the hardest hit by COVID and places like Italy, Spain, France and other countries who led the imperialist drive suffered at the hands of the unseen enemy. Interestingly enough, smaller countries like ours were well poised if only because of our size and topography to battle the virus. Maybe the economic policies of economies and diseconomies of scale can be referred to here. Principal, your mic is muted. There we go. You young people are the future. You are the young participants in this forum, and you as individuals are going to be saddled with the responsibility of leading and executing the reconstruction that is going to be necessary for this entire region and for the world. Today, your base is an economic one. However, I urge you to recognize as young people the interconnectivity of everything in life. As economic students, please do internalize the fact that the economy, the social fabric, and the political factors are always going to be connected. The symbiotic nature of the universe holds either the keys to our survival or the pathway to our destruction. It is my belief that you young people, you young men and women of Trinidad and Tobago and the Caribbean as a whole possess the creativity, the resilience, the knowledge, the tenacity, and the will to ensure not only that we survive, but that we prosper. Take charge of our will and make a difference. I'm urging you to be the change. Allow me to acknowledge the business department of Queens Royal College for organizing its fifth economic forum and to thank you for working with us on two previous occasions. Thank you. University of the West Indies, especially the economics department. It is this type of initiative from the youths coupled with the guidance from the experienced adults, such as Ms. Carla Bryan, the head of the business department of Queens Royal College, that will allow the world to make use of the opportunities to overcome challenges and facilitate development. When the Caribbean does this, then we would be able to stand proudly behind Walter Rodney's own book, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. And maybe, just maybe, we will be able to develop and to write our own books written by the youths of the region, how the Caribbean developed the world. I look forward to reading such a text. Maybe when we do so, then 
the parasitic metropolitan countries will stop referring to us as third world and they will understand that indeed there is only one world. To all the young people of Trinidad and Tobago, make a difference. I thank the panel in advance for the wonderful job that you are going to do. Thank you, Yui, for always being there. Thank you, Ms. Bryan and the students of Queens Royal College for having the drive and the vision. And I thank the audience for being the vessels of change in the future. I end with a simple quote in Latin. It says, bene e superesse. It means survive and prosper. Do have a wonderful and productive morning all. Thank you. Oh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to, again, the fifth uh, Youth Economic Forum, the partnership between the University of the West Indies and QRC. I would like to thank the coordinators of, of this, uh, this morning's uh, forum. Uh, no doubt a lot of planning went into put, putting together this forum, and it certainly promises to be a very rich forum. Thank you to uh, the uh, moderators, uh, Halima Sisbain, and thank you to Dr. Nurse for uh, your willingness to participate. Thank you to all of the uh, presenters for your willingness to also engage and participate as this continues to build on a past relationship and one that we look forward to uh, moving forward, actually look forward to this. Um, thank you to Principal uh, Simon and Ms. Carla Bryan for continuing to engage and allowing us to be part of the QRC family um, and we really appreciate that and we look forward to continue to build on this from year to year. Uh, no doubt anyone who knows me knows that I take with great pride listening to what the youth has to say because it is equally, if not more important, because it is their future, our future is at stake and our future to a large extent is in their hands. We look forward to hearing from the presenters. We know that it will be great. Uh, we know that you have a lot and we take pride in giving you an opportunity to voice uh, your, your thoughts uh, in this public forum and one that is even captured from year to year, Roxanne, we capture this, the media captures it as well. So you really do have a voice in this formal setting and we look forward to hearing what you have to say. To all of the participants, thank you for taking time out to join us. Under other circumstances, I would be saying thank you for braving the weather to join us. But under these new circumstances, I'll say, well, maybe the trek from the bedroom to the computer was maybe not so treacherous. <laughs> But uh, nonetheless, thank you all for joining us so early this morning. And again, I don't want to take away from the meaningful presentations that we look forward to. So without further ado, I would turn you back over to uh, Ms. Brian. And uh, thank you again for the opportunity. And good morning to all. And I look forward to, I will be with you for the duration of the proceeding. So I'm not going anywhere. I'll have some questions as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Conrad, and thank you, Mr. Simon, for your warm, welcoming remarks. I take the opportunity at this time to introduce our moderator, Dr. Roxanne Prezanson Martin. She is from the Tri Island State of Grenada, an instructor with the Department of Economics, University of the West Indies, St. Augustine campus and an associate with the Health Economics Unit, Center for Health Economics. She is a trained health and development economist specializing in health systems management, health financing, and healthcare access options and challenges in the Caribbean. Dr. Brizan St. Martin is the coordinator of the Court Youth Activities, which forms part of the Conference on the Economy the yearly landmark event of the Department of Economics. So ladies and gentlemen, I welcome Dr. Roxanne Brissanson Martin, who will moderate at this time. Hi, good morning everyone, and welcome to the Economic Forum of the Queens Royal College and the Court Youth of the Department of Economics. 
Today, we have a dynamic panel giving us perspectives on a range of issues relating to COVID-19 in the Caribbean, and I have the privilege of moderating this session. Without further ado, I will have the honor of introducing our presenters. They will each speak for approximately eight minutes, following which we would engage in a brief discussion between myself and the presenters. The general audience will then be allowed to pose questions via the chat feature in the Zoom. Please ensure you indicate which presenter your question or comment is being directed to. Our first speaker we have is Mr. Alexi Toussaint. Alexi Toussaint is an upper sixth form student of the QRC pursuing studies in economics, history, management of business and Caribbean studies. He is a school prefect and the head of the guidance officer department of the prefect body. Alexi wishes to study political science at the tertiary level and he had, he's an aspiring political advisor. Our second speaker, Mr. Abaya Sesaya, is an upper sixth form business student at QRC pursuing economics, management of business, accounting and Caribbean studies. He's desirous of becoming an entrepreneur. His, he enjoys football and is often involved in volunteerism activities in IT at his church. Our third speaker, Ms. Jordan Alexandra Raymond, is currently a year one undergraduate student at the University of the West Indies, pursuing a Bachelor of Science in Economics with a minor in Environmental Economics. She has represented Trinidad and Tobago in the 2019 World Affairs Seminar in Wisconsin, USA, and is also a member and a spokesperson for the Six Formers Association Services. Jordan has worked in collaboration with the Ministry of Education, Trinidad and Tobago during discussions on curriculum reform in both primary and secondary education in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. She's also an activist in support of issues such as climate action, racial equality, women's rights, and the rights of the differently abled. Our fourth speaker, Ms. Halima Alisis Bain, is a former National and World Bank Scholarship recipient. She is an economist at the HU Center for Health Economics at the University of the West Indies St. Augustine with over 14 years experience in research throughout the Caribbean in areas such as poverty, child, children and women, development economics, climate change and HIV and AIDS. She's also the holder of a Bachelor's of Laws degree from the University of London and is currently pursuing her legal practice certificate with the University of Law in the UK. Halima is also the director of an NGO focused on youth and community development in Trinidad and Tobago. Our final speaker for today, Dr. Keith Nurse, is the principal of the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College in St. Lucia. He has formerly served at the University of the West Indies as the World Trade Organization Chair, Executive Director at UWE Consulting Incorporated, Director of the Shirdat Ramphal Center for International Trade Law, Policy and Services, and a Senior Fellow at the Sir Arthur Lewis Institute of Social and Economic Studies. He's an adjunct for faculty at the Arthur Locke Jack Global School of Business in Trinidad and Tobago. Dr. Nurse has worked as a researcher and consultant to governments and international and regional organizations in a wide range of areas such as trade policy, trading services, intellectual property value capture, export diversification, and global value chain integration, industrial policy and innovation, and the list can go on. We welcome all our panelists. We will now have our first speaker, Mr. Alexi Toussaint, giving us an economic synopsis of the impact of COVID-19. Welcome, Alexi. Right, yes, thank you. Um, let me share my screen.
Right. Okay, so I'll be giving you the economic overview of 2020. And this presentation will be examining the four major economic indicators, GDP, unemployment, inflation, and national debt. Now, before I talk about 2020, we need to talk about what, what was happening in 2019, right? Because 2020 was a special year, right? So the economic growth has slowed in the borrowing members' countries, um, slowed down from an average of 1.6 in 2018 to 1% 1 in 2019. Now, this could be due to a plethora of different reasons, but I boil it down to four fundamental points. The US-China trade relations, the geopolitical concerns in the Middle East, the mountain social and um, environmental protests, and of course, natural disasters. Now, this graph shows that we were already staggering behind the world in terms of economic growth since 2019. Right? So it is no surprise that in 2020, it it was no surprise that in 2020 we were hit extremely hard by the COVID-19, right? As you can see here, almost all of the countries here had a negative growth rate within 2020, right? And again, a next graph to illustrate my point that we had, we've suffered greatly because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, that doesn't mean that every country, um, there was no light at the end of the tunnel for every country, I mean, for um, any country, right? Anguilla good book records going at a staggering 10.9% in 2019. Dominica falling steadily behind at 5.7%, right? Of course, we all know about Guyana, the new crown jewel of the Caribbean, as a lot of people will say, that um, they were predicted to have a growth rate of 71.6% for 2020, but again, due to the pandemic, it didn't live up to that expectations, but that is something to really think about, right? Now let's go to the second um, indicator, unemployment. Now unemployment in the Caribbean at the end of 2019 was at 8.1%. Was at However, over the years, Unemployment has been decreasing steadily within the Caribbean. Now, as you can see here, this, um, this slide illustrates my point that the unemployment rate has been steadily decreasing in many of the countries, not all, but many of the countries, like for example, the Bahamas and Trinidad slightly, and of course, Jamaica, right? And again, to reinforce my point, unemployment rate was steadily decreasing prior to the pandemic. But again, the pandemic came along and there was an, uh, a massive increase in unemployment rates within a lot of the Caribbean nations. For example, Trinidad and Tobago, prior to the pandemic had a 3% cheap, um, unemployment rate. But due to the pandemic, the unemployment rate was projected to be around 30%. Now, that doesn't mean that every country, again, didn't have the had a stable unemployment rate, right? For example, Grenada had a staggering 29% unemployment rate, right? So we get it just there. Again, with the youths, the, this is surprising that the youths unemployment rate has been growing since, um, since 2013, right? And it is projected to continue going at that rate. Now, Abai will touch on this later on in his presentation. Now, we have inflation. The inflation rate at the end of 2019 averaged around 1.7%. Now, it was going on steadily, but due to the pandemic, it is expected to rise because of you know, fiscal policies that were used to mitigate the effects of the pandemic. Again, this illustrates my point like, um, once more that our inflation, the inflation rate will rise as the time passes by. 
subscribe. And again, it, this shows the inflation rate compared to previous years, and it shows that we will have an increase in inflation rate. All right, let's go to national debt. Now the national debt has been decreasing. Well, it, the national debt did decrease in 2019. The debit ratio fell in 10 of the borrowing members countries with the steepest decline in Barbados from 126.3% to 119.5%. Then of course you have Grenada from 62.7% to 55.8%. Now you get the gist, it was decreasing. The medium public debt burden declined marginally from 20, I mean, 62.7% in 2018 to 62% in 2019, right? But now due to the pandemic and of course fiscal and monetary policies that is needed to mitigate the effects of the COVID-19, it is predicted to rise. Again, this shows that the public debt has always been a major problem within the Caribbean. And a lot of the Caribbean are in need of trying to decrease it. Again, it shows that it will increase in the following years due to the needed spending on mitigating the effects of COVID-19. Now, in conclusion, the GDP growth rate has been increasing since 2018, and with the extra pressure of COVID-19, many of the Caribbean nations will experience a contraction, may experience a contraction, it's now, yeah, the contraction in growth in 2020 and in 2021. Again, unemployment was relatively low, but with COVID-19, it rose precipitously, right? Then you have national debt, national debt has, been a major problem within the last few years. However, the debt was projected to decrease. But again, COVID-19 had other problem, um, other plans. Then inflation rate, the inflation rate has been steadily decreasing since 20, 2015 and was expected to continue on its trajectory. However, COVID-19 will cause an increase in inflation rate. Again, all in all, economic contraction has been projected to be around 7.9% in 2020, and the growth is projected to be around 4.2% for 2021. Recovering of the Caribbean economies will be slow and is expected to return to pre-crisis level by 2024. Right? Again, I have my sources here because, of course, stealing is wrong. Right, I have to name my sources. So I have my reference here, of course, for anybody who would like to go in depth into the data, right? Right, again, thank you for the opportunity to share that with you guys. All right, thank you, Alexi, for that presentation of course, and for the economic synopsis around these key economic indicators, which no doubt will impact the performance of key sectors in the economy. And one of the things I like about your presentation is that you took the time to, to look at where we're coming from. It is important when we contextualize in where we are and where we are going to take a view of where we have come from. So we thank you. Again, um, for our general audience, please feel free to post your questions in the Zoom chat. We will now have Mr. Abaya Sensar, who will speak to us on the future of education. Abaya. Okay, thanks. Good day. Good day, everyone. I'm sorry, good morning, everyone. I'm presenting the future of education. The Calypsonian Mighty Sparrow sang one song, education, education. This is the foundation. Our rising population needs some education. Next slide, next slide, next slide. Oh. It is very important to know that 
education is essential to a society's economic development. This is because it builds a Hold on. As we know it, education is essential to a society's economic development. This is because it builds the nation's human capital and also aids in skill development, such as higher, learn higher thinking. This is analyzing and evaluating complex information, social skills, emotional intelligence, and problem solving. These skills can be transferred into the working environment in the future. First, we must consider the state. What? As stated, what? as stated in the UN. Let's go. Hold on. Let's go. Bye, your, your mic is muted. All right, thanks. Right. As we, first we must consider the state of education during the COVID crisis. According to a report on August 2020 by Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean countries entitled Education in the Time of COVID, Caribbean countries have used three main areas of action, distance learning modalities through variety of formats and platforms to support and mobilization of education personnel and communities. Three, concern for the health and overall well-being of students. Some of these challenges are connectivity. This may relate to the lack of access of to lack of access of the internet and learning devices. For example, the region had 60.4% percentage of the 43 point million problem and population estimate for the Caribbean region as at December 31st, 2019. Next point is differentiated teaching and learning. Different persons can learn the same information differently. As so, online will favor visual and auditory learners. My next, next point is education in the tertiary level enrollment. For example, in this newspaper article on February 22nd by newspaper, Newsday, it was mentioned that there was a decrease of more than 1,000 students from the previous year compared to the 20 to 21 enrollment in UE. Preschoolers learning stunted. Preschoolers development is not if preschoolers development is not utilized during the critical age of three years to five years, there will be future implications. And you can receive this information on Caribbean Medical Journal, volume 76, 2014. Opportunities for stakeholders. Opportunities, I will highlight the opportunities, maximize the learning outside of the classroom, use of technology, and implementation of module to suit Caribbean education. Maximize the learning outside of classroom. Asynchronous learning helps in developing 
time management skills as students may take the time to pace themselves in certain studies and, the, and learn the content, content differently than just on video conferencing. Teachers can utilize their time to prepare the work and deliver the work in a new and convenient way online. Use of technology. Organization of teaching and learning through the use of various platforms, students and teachers will learn and develop new 21st century skills. Different learning styles can be harnessed through the modern teaching and learning techniques. For example, the Samara model created by Dr. Ruben Puente Dura to facilitate technology into the classroom. The letters Samara means substitution, augmentation, modification, and redefinition. Students can learn through gamification and simulation, which were not as prominent prevalent prior to the pandemic. Furthermore, stakeholders in the region can collaborate to a greater extent. This means that they should find, adapt, modify a model to fit the Caribbean context in education. In so doing, they should in maintain and develop existing methods of online learning blending this is considered as blending learning where students and teachers incorporate technology in the physical space of the classroom and it helps to reinforce the importance of education to conclude my presentation so envision a school in 30 30 years from now, no physical learning spaces, a new learning methods and resources, no access self, how will the region fit into this given our financial and economic development, um, developmental reality? Thank you for listening. All right, thank you, Abaya. Um, thank you for the contribution on the way forward for education. No doubt education is one of the most important indicators of a country's development. And uh, I, I think the Samar model you mentioned is, is a very important contribution in light of your point as well on differentiated teaching and learning. Um, the point on greater collaboration among stakeholders in the Caribbean is one that has been a topic for discussion, and I'm sure a lot of questions will come from your, um, your, your presentation this morning. Before we go into um, any of the discussions, we want to continue with our panelists. We now have speaking on the issue of food security agricultural diversification and COVID-19, we have Ms. Jordan Raymond. Jordan? Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, today, I will be talking about COVID-19 and our dependence on external suppliers for our food and how we can help this situation by diversifying our economies. Let's begin by talking about the Caribbean. Caribbean territories are generally economically characterized by a number of factors, which includes our small size, both demographically and geographically in most instances, our openness, which leaves us dependent on international markets for our exports and our imports, and our monocrop practices, where our territories tend to have either a vested interest in one sector, namely tourism or primary goods production. These unique characters characteristics are the very reason that we are left vulnerable to external shocks, such as natural disasters, which destroy infrastructure and result in the loss of life and property, destroying the natural environment that is utilized to support the tourism industry in, ter in territories such as Aruba, the Bahamas, and Dominica, to name a few. Here in the Caribbean, we are very prone to hurricanes, and in the recent past, these weather systems have led to the destruction of property 
and has damaged billions of dollars worth of infrastructure and has generally inflicted a serious blow on the tourism industry. Furthermore, as the threat of climate change continues to materialize, there is much concern for the future of tourism in these hurricane-prone territories. We are also vulnerable to the spillover effects of financial crises, such as the 1973 OPEC oil crisis, which caused Trinidad and Tobago's economy to dive into a deep recession, as the oil revenues here dropped by more than 26% in comparison to the previous year. It also caused a rise in unemployment and a fall in the real GDP. Another international financial crisis that crippled the Caribbean was the global financial crisis of 2008 which just as the 1973 crisis caused most Caribbean territories to have a major economic downturn and increased unemployment rates, reduced oil prices, and increased the cost of consumer durables. Furthermore, we are also left very vulnerable to the socioeconomic impacts of global pandemics, such as the recent COVID-19 virus, officially known as the SARS-CoV-2 virus. As you all know, this virus made its debut in Wuhan, China in the latter half of 2019. And as a result of globalization and the ease of global travel, all in conjunction with the high contagiousness of the virus, led the WHO to declare it a global health crisis in January 2020. This virus ravaged the economies and is responsible for the deaths of an excess of 2.4 million people around the globe. After observing the failure of developed countries like the United States and Europe to respond adequately to this pandemic, which resulted in a high infection and subsequent high death rate, CARICOM territories responded swiftly to the ongoing pandemic and we closed our borders, introduced quarantine measures, imposed social distancing protocols, all in an attempt to contain the virus. As a result of us closing our borders to safeguard against the pandemic, our regional tourism export fell drastically in these tourism focused territories, taking employment down with it, as, according to the IMF, tourism accounts for 50 to 90% of GDP and employment for most Caribbean territories. According to the Economic Commission for Latin America and Caribbean countries, this has resulted in the total GDP growth in the Caribbean to fall by 8% in 2019. Our commodity exports as a region contributes to over 50% in most instances to our GDP. And these were also indirectly affect. Our commodity markets in the exportation of gold, bauxite, and nickel from territories like Jamaica and Suriname face a serious economic blow, especially as the, uh, the global prices of these commodities fell. For Guyana and Trinidad and Tobago, territories involved in downstream industry, the pandemic occurred at a time when the oil and natural gas market was already facing challenges and the prices were low. As this disease remains grossly uncontained, global oil production and value suffers and the prices of oil and gas continues to decline, resulting in a loss of exports and fiscal revenues. So as dependent as we are on our export market, we are also like heavily reliant on our import market for the overwhelming majority of what we consume. This includes manufactured and final goods such as technology, cars, consumer durables, and most importantly, our food. One of the main weaknesses that has been exposed by this pandemic is our growing dependence on imported food from places like the United States, Canada, and Latin America. The CARICOM Food Import Bill in 2018 stood at an astonishing 4.17 billion US dollars with Guyana, Belize, and Haiti being the only CARICOM territories that produced more than 50% of the world's consumed. This food import bill represents upwards of 60% of total food consumption for almost all CARICOM members, with half of them importing more than 80% of what they consume. Even the inputs in the production of locally produced food and beverages are sourced externally and imported. Moreover, in many areas, national food production has declined, especially in the areas of citrus, vegetables, rice, and they have been replaced with imports. For instance, in Trinidad and Tobago, the national flour mills figures have indicated a significant decline in rice production over the past two decades from 21,200 tons to 585 tons in 2019, in spite of the fact that the local consumption of rice is 34,000 tons annually. 
Another example is in Jamaica, where the domestic consumption of imported onions and other aluminum varieties as of 2019 was 10 million kilograms per year. According to the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, the FAO, this not only has negative fiscal effects, but also social impacts, including loss of employment, the decline in general welfare of rural communities, neglect of rural infrastructure, and higher urban, uh, rural to urban migration, causing increased stress on urban infrastructure and rising food security concerns. This lack of local production has negative consequences for CARICOM territories. The, con the contribution of agriculture to the GDP is on the decline as the time goes on. It's less than 2% in contribution for Barbados and St. Kitts and Nevis, and it's less than 1% in Trinidad and Tobago. This low agriculture production with a high food import bill leaves our region vulnerable to global food shocks, which have been currently induced as a result of the pandemic. As food prices have decreased due to the food prices have increased, sorry, due to the increased cost of production brought on by a fall in the labor supply, as well as supply chain disruptions. In order for us here in the Caribbean to ensure sustainable food security, CARICOM territories can take advantage of this disadvantageous position by diversifying our economies away from monocrop practices and engaging in agricultural production to replace our food imports with local commodities. This agricultural production can be used as a catalyst for economic growth and a method for CARICOM territories to wean our way out of this dependence infused vulnerability and achieve sustainable food security. As I previously mentioned, we import the majority of our food, right? It is estimated that if we replace just 10% of our imported fruits and vegetables with locally grown commodities in selected territories, we can save at least 33.3 million US dollars per year. Not only would it save millions of dollars, but the CARICOM fruit and vegetable sector could also promote nutrition security and have long-term health impacts. This is also expected to create at least 67,000 rural jobs and support rural communities and as well as revive the agriculture sector. It is also suggested that regionally, 10% import substitution would benefit the Bahamas and Trinidad and Tobago the most significantly, especially as Trinidad is one of the region's largest importers of agricultural products and the Bahamas food import ratio is 0.92, which is 21% above the region's average. In Jamaica, according to economist Donovan Sandberry, the most worrying and disappointing aspect of Jamaica's imports of plant-based foods relates to the importation of coconut products, 8.2 million US dollars, coffee products, nearly 2 million US dollars, cocoa products, 10.3 million US dollars, and banana and plantain chips, 9.2 million US dollars, which are all products from traditionally strong export sectors that have declined significantly. Thus, reviving the agriculture sector can thereby promote job security and, in 2019, according to the private sector organization of Jamaica, this import substitution can be the solution to the volatility of Jamaica's currency. Moreover, in order for CARICOM economies to make the switch over more effective, we must carefully consider which crops we must produce. There are opportunities for cassava production, which, according to the FAO, has the potential to replace 400,000 metric tons of wheat, which is typically used for flour, bread, feed, food, and beer. It can help reduce the region's food import bill by 5%. North American jams and jellies can be replaced with locally made jam like go like over jam. Mangoes can replace apples, peaches, and pears. Some territories, however, have already started this importation substitution strategy. Import substitution has played a major role in St. Lucia's economic strategy. According to Agriculture Minister, Dr. Etikel Joseph, the country imports some 7 million in produce identified for the country's food substitution program. These are lettuces, cabbage, watermelon, cantaloupes, bell peppers, pineapples, and tomatoes. Production of food in these very areas has been encouraged through incentives and technical support that is being facilitated through a partnership with the Taiwanese government. So, in conclusion, it can now be said that the region's dependence on imported food, which has been highlighted as a result of the recent pandemic, can be reduced if we reduce our food import bill. This can be done by diversifying our monocrop economies by producing agricultural products. 
This now will help us achieve sustainable food security, as well as have positive spillover effects on the rest of the economy, such as nutrition security and employment. Thank you. Thank you, Jordan. And thank you for this critical um, presentation as it relates to the future of agriculture in the Caribbean. And again, um, just to highlight the link to other important sectors, I thought that was very critical in your presentation and it shows our interconnectedness of our sectors and even our countries in the region. Um, one of the things that stood out to me in your presentation, it took me back to something Professor Pantin always said that an understanding of the history and the dynamic of the Caribbean is essential when we have to make an informed analysis of economic challenges, both present and in the future. I like the fact that you brought in that dialogue on import substitution, which is not new in the region, and it may bring some discussions there in terms of what can we do differently because it's, it's not the same time. We have a lot of things, um, we're doing things differently, times are changing. So um, thank you for that presentation. All right, our next speaker is taking a different angle and is speaking on the issue of COVID-19 and the rights of children. Ms. Halima Ali Sisbeen. Halima. Hi, good morning. And thank you, Chair, and to the organizing committee. Thank you for inviting me to be a panelist on today's session. Um, before I get into the meat of my presentation, I just want to say that KRC is close to my heart. My brother would have attended KRC. Um, having been appointed the West Indies under 15 captains, I hear Ali um while attending qrc so qrc big up to you um so let me just jump into my presentation quickly let me start sharing the screen are you guys seeing it yeah yes okay great so my contribution today to the discussion relates to COVID-19 and the rights of the child. Now we have heard a lot about COVID-19 and the wide range of impacts, um, but I thought it would have been really good to look at the circumstances surrounding COVID-19 and the likely interactions with the rights of the child. Now the discussion has emerged globally, so my presentation will just seek to present to you a snapshot of that wider discussion. My presentation will first look at and um, seek to provide some information as to what is the Convention on the, right, on the Rights of the Child. It will also provide some context in terms of the situation of children in Trinidad and Tobago, as well as I would have a brief look at the likely impacts of COVID-19 on the rights of children. Now, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, and I know many of the children may have heard it um, during the UN um, ads and so on on Facebook, but the Convention on the Rights of the Child is an international human rights treaty it was ratified by, in, by Trinidad and Tobago in 1991, and it really aims to protect the rights of children in all areas of their life, all right? It guides, it seeks to also guide policy as it relates to the development of the children. And I want the students who are, who are tuned in to have a look at that table on the side, on the right side of the screen. And you will see there listed for you are the convention rights. And among those we see, the right to education, and I know we had a, a previous discourse on education. We see also the right to health, the right to protection from abuse, including sexual abuse and child labor, the right to decent standard of living, and the right to leisure, recreation, play, etc. Now, these are internationally established rights and are well known globally, and we do respect them here. And our na draft national policy was designed within the context of the rights of the child. Now, with respect to Trinidad and Tobago's response, so I, and I just mentioned, the draft national policy was stabled in 2019, and it really aims to improve the conditions of children in Trinidad and Tobago. We've also seen some legal and institutional changes, and what this simply means, 
um, for our students is that laws have been put in place and also the institutions to ensure that those laws are ad adhered to were also mobilized and, and put into place by the government. And I'm, I just mentioned a couple of the laws there. If you do have time, you can take a look at the laws and see what you as children, what you as a child, what rights you have. And those will give you some information on that. We've also had in Trinidad and Tobago, we have sectoral responses that really look towards improving children's lives. So for example, and very close to, to um, students would be um, school feeding programs. And I know you know of that, and which really seek to improve health and nutrition um, and ensure survival and development and so on. We also have vaccination that has been um, ongoing for, for quite a bit of time in Trinidad. In terms of a snapshot of Trinidad with respect to the situation of children. I've just mentioned what the response has been in Trinidad. We have had some gains made and we're seeing, or we have seen, um, for example, declines in infant and under five mortality. We have seen elimination of mother to child transmission of HIV and AIDS. Um, in Trinidad again and Tobago, we've seen increased access to health care health centers develop in the recent process. We have three primary education, secondary, we've, we had um, gate, now we have a different approach used um, for the gate program. We have free transportation to students in uniform, um, to university students, four university students with um, a pass with their ID cards. We have also targeted assistance through the so social safety nets, um, safety net programs like, and I mentioned GATE already. With respect to child protection, we have implemented, the government of Trinidad and Tobago have implemented laws and put institutions in place. And I, you may have heard about the child, the children's authority and all in an, in an effort towards promoting and fulfilling children's rights in Trinidad and Tobago and to protect them from um, abuse, violence, and so on. <clears throat> but all in all, while these gains have been made, we do have some challenges and we do continue to experience um, challenges and we are not alone in the globe that experience these challenges. Some of these issues are spread across the world and many other countries have similar experiences. For example, we have, um, sexual and reproductive health issues where we have um, young children, adolescents getting involved in sexual activities, early unions, we have child sexual abuse, we've been hearing about that in the news, um, increasing child obesity, and we have emerging on our horizon, we have mental health issues that are leading um, in some instances to self-destruction. We have, have, we have some issues also with education, where teenage pregnancies are leading to school dropouts, um, gang recruitment leading to school, to school dropouts, particularly for the males. We have issues relating to child protection. We have youth involvement in crime. And importantly, youth being not only involved in crime, but impacted by crime. In some instances, they are the victims of crime. Um, we also see discrimination and marginalization with respect to where persons, where students, where children live. Persons feel discriminated because of their place of residence. We have emerging issues of migrant children. We have, they're having issues relating to whether they can access school, what protection is afforded to them with respect to sexual exploitation. So while we, as I said, while we have made gains, we do continue to grapple with these challenges. Now, what I will do here, I'm just citing for you quickly, the HU was involved in two pieces of research with, with the UNDP and UNICEF that focus on multidimensional poverty in Trinidad and in Trinidad, sorry, um, the Tobago leg um, still needs to be uh, completed. But what I pulled here for you, I'm pulling some quotes from that study. It involved primary research. And um, let's, if you're seeing my cursor, you'll see I'm reading a child comment here for you. When we, when we asked the child about their community, this is what the child told us. In, community, in my community, it has smokers, drinkers, 
shooters in the middle of the night they are playing music cussing and fighting in each other it have gangs in the area and youths following their rules i'm going to read one from the adults here teenage pregnancy causes dropout in secondary it's supposed to be school for the boys involvement in drug leads to dropout and these are just two of the opinions I'm, i shared a child child's opinion i'm sharing an adult opinion and this is what persons are holding true in terms of issues that are affecting them. Now, in terms of our present presentation today, I'm now going to bring to you and bring together and show you how the challenges we face are affecting the rights of the child. So on a, my column here to the left, I just mentioned challenges such as crime, gang initiation, teenage pregnancy, et cetera. These have a direct bearing on the rights of the child. So we are seeing our rights to education. When we have a teenage pregnancy drop, um, induced dropout, we have that person's right to education has been compromised, has been undermined. We're seeing a decent standard of living. When you have child labor, when you have exploitation, you have compromised um, standard of living. When persons are abused, you have um, a compromised protection for the child in terms of from violence and so on. So this is how the challenges relate to the rights of the child. Now I'm going to bring it home to you now with respect to linking it directly to COVID-19. What our research is pointing to, and we need further research to, to, to um, corroborate this, but and the international literature is looking towards and is, is hinting towards Circumstances surrounding COVID-19 and in particular lockdown and stay-at-home measures, they are likely to worsen the challenges that I just mentioned to you and perhaps introduce new ones. So if we look at one of the um, rights of the child, which speaks to survival and development, we're seeing that COVID-19, people are losing their jobs and who did not lose their jobs perhaps are facing reduced household income from um, reduce working hours. We're seeing that also parents are um, having issues dealing with being home with their children and so on. Now these have adverse impacts on, for example, if you if you have um, if you lost your job, for example, you don't have the income necessary to provide for your family. So that automatically has a direct impact on food and nutrition for your children, for your household members. We're also finding that there may be impacts related to the ability to access key services like education and health. And let me give you an example. To attend a, a, a hospital, for example, and students will know, some, of, some persons use public transport, private transport. If you lose your income, you don't have the money, how are you going to pay the taxi fare to get to the hospital? How are you going to pay the taxi fare, get to the hospital to have your child vaccinated. And these are issues, these are real issues, real challenges that we're facing on the ground. With respect to education, and I'm running quickly because I know my, my presentation is a bit long and I have only 10, eight to 10 minutes. So I'm, I'm running quickly. With respect to education, we're seeing that school there have been school closures and still students are out of school for almost a year now. There have been concerns and, and aired on media, aired on social media platform, technology, technological bar barriers as it relates to education. We've heard stories of students not having computers, not having devices, not having internet access. And let me give you an example of how this education part is linked to the survival and development. If your household income has reduced, if your mother or father lost their job, how are they going to continue to pay for your internet? So immediately you see a direct relationship with respect to your circumstances of your household and your right to education. We also see that lack of ability of parents to assist or facilitate the learning, the lack of the capacity. Now, this is not in any way to... Um, to sound bad for any parent or whatever but what we're seeing is that sometimes the parents themselves and this is even for persons who are in secondary school the parents cannot assist the child because they they themselves lack the capacity to provide the assistance so that at home assistance is missing 
um, and I'm sure depicting here for you, the school closures had, have led to persons now becoming best friends with their laptop or with their devices. So where you had students speaking to each other in person or reading together in schools and on the benches, you now have an individual speaking to a laptop. Yes, they're speaking, the person is behind the laptop, but in essence, it's, it's really speaking to a laptop. Um, with respect to protection from abuse and other forms of violence, we've seen that parents are struggling to deal with their, or to cope with their decreasing income or their loss, their job loss. Um, also, parents are struggling to adapt to increased time in their home. For, so parents are indicating this is the first time that the entire family is home except on a weekend. More hours of ho at home, people are in each other's faces, persons are living in extended families, extended family members and neighbors are even supervising children. What does that say for abuse? What does that say for neglect? These are issues. These are things that would interfere or undermine the rights that these our children, that you, the children have, okay? In terms of leisure, play and recreation, we're seeing limited social activities, outdoor sports, face-to-face -face environment has been replaced with the virtual school environment. And we're seeing that concerns have been raised with the mental health issues surrounding a student being on a laptop, studying, being socially engaging, there are issues relating to that. And let me draw your attention, and I, this is perhaps some homework for the students. There was a recent um, um, a release on CMC3 with the former direct chairman, sorry, of the Children's Authority. And he spoke, he's a, a clinical psychologist, and he spoke of there being a 40% increase in um, the number of cases of, of children coming to see him for mental, they call it Zoom tiredness or Zoom um, frustration. So those are things, those are real experiences that children are going through. Where do you draw the line? Entire days are being spent on computers. How do you manage and mitigate the fallouts from that? Okay, in concluding, what we are seeing or what we expect to see is a widening of the gaps with respect to contravention of the contraventions of the rights of the child. And this may actually reverse some of the things that we would have done to advance the rights of the child. So for example, the government would have made free education, but COVID-19 came on board, now children are out of school. So we are basically back to square one, if I may take the privilege of saying that, until we get back out to school. So some of the progress that we have made may be rolled back, however, all is not lost. What we should remember is that, yes, governments and those in authority, our international organizations, are basically focused on surviving through the pandemic. What the other stakeholders need to do, and stakeholders, I mean NGOs, parents, teachers, lecturers, other persons in society, we need to take a conscious effort in order to ensure that the, the, the gains that we've made with children rights are not reversed. And I want to hear from you in your discussion, students. I, I urge you to engage with me and the other panelists. Let us hear from you what you think as children, as students, as young people, where what we can do to help to ensure that the, your status with respect to your rights are maintained and not eroded as we move further into COVID-19 measures, because we are not sure what the landscape will be. How do we address and ensure that our children are protected? Our children are the future of our country. So in closing, I want to share with you some of my information sources. And I will have this forwarded through Roxanne, Dr. Brizan St. Martin, um, to your teacher and she can share with you. And so you can look into and have a read of the different articles and be enlightened on the issues that I just discussed. Thank you, Roxanne. All right, thank you, Halima, and thank you for this presentation. It really took on a different angle, which is not widely addressed or has not been widely addressed throughout this pandemic, not discounting the contributions of other 
um, webinars and seminars, but this is one of the seminars that I've heard this, um, this area being focused on. There are so many angles on child rights, um, as you highlighted, health, migration, violence at home, sexual exploitation, the snapshot of children in Trinidad and Tobago, particularly the challenges. It also highlights the need for more tailored interventions to ensure children are protected and you know you protect the future generations because we speak a lot about sustainability and sustainable development and we need to, to to place some focus on that i really like the the link that you made on mental health and children it's something that sometimes we tend to brush off in our you know our caribbean context and it's of critical importance particularly as we navigate through the covid19 pandemic where you know children are being faced with different challenges as as time goes by um before we we will come back to you in terms of questions and answers so far we've have we have a lot of questions um but before we deal with that let's take our last presenter dr nurse who will speak to us on entrepreneurial opportunities in the new normal dr nurse Is Dr. Nuss on? Okay, so I'm not seeing Dr. Nuss as yet. So in the interim, while we, we wait for him to come on, I will just like to um, have a round of questions here because we have quite a bit of questions. One of our first questions is to Alexi. Alexi, um, uh, one of our participants would like to know, the, the, you, you mentioned that there were um, factors that will cause increased prices. What are the factors that will contribute to those increase in prices? And what can be done to increase, or sorry, what can be done to decrease the vast increase in unemployment? Alexi. That's a great question. Um, of course, the government of the Caribbean had to um, print money to to pay for its fiscal um, policies because again, the pandemic was hard on everybody, and it was. I think it's the it was the government responsibility to mitigate the effects of it. So. That's one way of inflation and prices rising because they had to um, increase the printing of money to, of course, uh, mitigate the effects of the COVID-19. A next factor that would contribute to um, the inflation rate could be due to, to um, it could be due to, uh, the monetary policies too, especially um, seeing that that I think a lot of the the recent um, dollars were printed in the last six months. So I I think that it really boils down to the printing of money and the the central bank to really support is physical policies that could can lead to increase in prices as the supply of money increases. So I think that is a major factor. All right, and the last thing was, what can be done to decrease the vast increase of unemployment? Um, there, I mean, there's a plethora of different reasons. This isn't the easy question, but... Um, I think that I am. I have always been a fan of the, the free market. I think that moving forward, we should allow the invisible hand, as Adam Smith will call it, to take place in Trinidad and Tobago. Because I think that we had we had enough um, experience with the government of the past to know that the government isn't really competent enough to strategically plan out the the um, economic policies for the future. 
So I think that we should allow the free market and the private sector to, to really take charge of the nation and allow people to engage in voluntary exchange to really decrease um, unemployment rate. I think that's the, the best way to um, solve that problem. All right, thank you so much, Alexi. All right, now we will move on now to Dr. Keith Nurse, who will speak to us on entrepreneurial opportunities in the new normal. Dr. Nurse. Yes, hi, good morning. It's a pleasure to be with you. Um, I'm just pulling up my presentation now. Let me see how much of an honor it is. Um, I'm not a, a graduate from QRC, um, but I've had many family members who have been. In fact, my grandfather was, a, was given an award by QRC several years ago um, as the oldest surviving QRC boy. So our roots at QRC runs deep in the family. One of my son, my son is at the at the um, at QRC, so it's a real pleasure to to be participating in the conference. I'm also a graduate from UWI, the Faculty of Social Sciences. Um, my PhD is from the Institute of International Relations. Yes, so the, I'm going to talk about entrepreneurial opportunities in the new normal. I have lots of slides. So I'm going to try and do this very quickly, and I think a lot of the the ground has been covered by my excellent panelists. So kudos to them, I think they've done an excellent job. Um, I'm gonna try and do three things very quickly. Do a quick overview of the economic impact of COVID-19 crisis, not just on the Caribbean, but globally. And then talk about the theoretical perspectives on diversification, innovation, and entrepreneurship. I'm gonna talk about two particular um, authors or scholars. And, um, and then I'll give my five picks for growth of entrepreneurship in the Caribbean. So first off, um, a few months ago, I, I did a publication for the UN um, Disaster Risk Reduction Agency, looking at the impact of COVID-19 on the Caribbean private sector with a focus on the telecommunications um, sector. Um, so just jumping off the, the last point from the panelists who just responded to some of the questions. Um, but COVID-19 is not just a public health crisis is actually an economic and trade crisis and a social and political um, crisis. And so there are three crises happening all at the same time, largely provoked by the pandemic, um, but the pandemic is exacerbating existing vulnerabilities in the Caribbean context and in other parts of the world. But the Caribbean um, or key fragilities are what are being um, impacted. So, what I have here is just some data that compared different countries in the region in terms of their hazard exposure and their vulnerability to, to COVID-19 and so on. These figures have changed quite a bit in the last few months. So for example, St. Lucia, where I am, has had a, has had a huge surge in COVID-19 cases, um, whereas Toronto has been able to pull down their numbers quite significantly. So, um, so the, 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 the response capacity in many respects is the critical issue, as well as the underlying vulnerabilities. And if you look at the data in terms of the impact, already the Caribbean countries had um, significant challenges with their foreign exchange reserves. Um, Trinidad and Tobago is actually um, one of the better off countries. So for example, relative to the potential impact of COVID-19, our foreign exchange reserves were pretty high. But for most other countries in the region, um, import coverage, which we use as a key indicator, is a, in a, a very negative position. And so once you add all of the issues relating to COVID-19, for example, the loss in GDP, uh, increase in debtedness, so most countries are gonna have a huge debt overhang coming out of COVID, um, the collapse of tourism, will tourism come back in the way it was before? Not likely. Um, it's going to go through a process of transformation. Um, things like reduction in remittances are also a key factor. So what we know is that this economic crisis associated with the pandemic is the worst that we've had um, 
in, in centuries actually. Um, and so um, the, the impact in terms of recessionary impact is very deep and will be very sustained. Um, the, if you look at most Caribbean countries, it's tourism that's the key driver of their economies. Uh, Trinidad and Tobago, again, is an exception in this regard. Uh, and even if you look at external debt to GDP ratios, Trinidad and Tobago is on the low side. So in many respects, Trinidad and Tobago is in a more favorable position than most other Caribbean territories. Uh, I know Trinidad, um, people living in Trinidad and Tobago can't even believe that. But yes, in countries like the Bahamas or in St. Lucia, where I am, um, the impact of COVID is even more significant than it is in the context of Trinidad and Tobago. And Trinidad and Tobago is in fact, somehow a bit secured because of its oil and gas um, sector and earnings. Um, but that is no cause for celebration. In fact, it is also one of the key vulnerabilities for the government and the people of Trinidad and Tobago. If you look at what's been happening globally, and I just plotted this data um, last night actually, um, world exports have dropped dramatically. Um, as, and, and you can see world imports um, and this merchandise imports have dropped even more dramatically. So it really means that there's been a, a, a demand compression globally. And that demand compression has impacted on different sectors. Um, but you could see that what we've had is this um, double dip, meaning that the, um, the current pandemic is actually coming in the wake of the 2007-2008 economic and financial crisis. And so what we are seeing is a, uh, an extension of that um, major depressionary phase in, um, flowing into another major depressionary phase. And it's impacted different sectors um, uh, in a variable way. So for example, total merchandise uh, um, trade has dropped by 21%. Um, in the last quarter or the second quarter of 2020. Um, but look at the impact that it's had on fuels and mining products. And so Trinidad and Tobago is particularly affected when um, the, the price of um, hydrocarbons and, and, and gas and um, fuel prices dropped quite considerably. In fact, went in, they went into the negative zone. Uh, but similarly, uh, manufacturers have been impacted um, agricultural products to a lesser extent. Now, how do we make sense of all of this? Um, I'm the principal and president of the Arthur Lewis Community College. I've done a lot of work on Arthur Lewis and in his magnum opus, which is entitled Growth and Fluctuations. He explains what happens to peripheral economies, economies like our own, when the engine of growth slows down. What do you mean by the engine of growth is the, the developed market economies. And so he says that, yes, the, the classic things happen. Decline in terms of trade between commodities and manufacturers, reduced commodity exports, balance of payments problems, external indebtedness, meaning debt crises, and an accumulation of social debt, meaning a reversal of some of the gains like in education, health, infrastructure, and so on, that you would have had during an upswing period. But most importantly, he says that there tends to be a surge of industrialization. And that's what I want to focus on for the rest of my presentation. Because we could talk about the challenges until the cows come home. The question is, are we in a position or are we taking, up, are we seizing the opportunities that come with a crisis? Because in every global crisis, there are significant opportunities. So for example, Joseph Schumpeter argues that during global crises, what you have is a process of creative destruction where disruptive technologies and new modes of operating um, come into being. And so it is your capacity to ride a new wave that makes the difference going forward for your society and your economy. And if you are not in a position to take advantage of the new opportunities, then you're going to have a really rough time. And so that becomes the critical issue um, going forward. So, um, I'm a big fan of, of Schumpeter's work as well as Lewis's work, because what they're suggesting is this, is that the global economy and the winds of opportunity are not static 
or steady state. They're very dynamic, if not circular or cyclical. And so during periods of economic crisis, new opportunity emerges for diversification, for innovation, and for entrepreneurship. So for example, here are my five top picks for where Caribbean countries need to diversify. Tourism is our biggest source of foreign exchange earnings in the region, biggest source of exports, and biggest source of employment. But our retention in tourism is somewhere between 10 and 12% of every dollar spent by a tourist. We have a very leaky bucket called our tourism industry. Um, whereas in countries like Costa Rica, their um, retention rate um, in, the, in the tourism sector is as much as 50%. So four times, if not five times higher than in the Caribbean. And that's because as many of our presenters indicated, not only do Caribbean people eat a lot of foreign food, our foreign tourists eat a lot of foreign food as well. Um, and most of the, 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 um, the hotel plant is owned by foreigners. But we need to diversify tourism away from the traditional sun, sea, sand, and surf into educational tourism, medical tourism, looking at cultural and heritage tourism, digital nomads, um, and so forth. The other key area for growth is low carbon competitiveness, a real critical issue for Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, we have a huge um, carbon footprint in Trinidad and Tobago because of our oil and gas sector, but also because of all the traffic in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, lots of cars on the road, poor public transport. So the circular economy, renewable energy, green and blue economy, are huge growth areas um, that we need to tap into. Then there's health and food resilience. Some of it was mentioned by, your, by my co-panelists. Um, but the Caribbean has the um, an enviable um, position of having one of the highest incidences of chronic non-communicable diseases in the world. Um, the um, hypertension, diabetes, and so on are off the charts. Child obesity is growing at a rapid rate. However, most of our investments go into curative medicine rather than into preventative health. And that's a huge growth area. This can be supported by med tech and telemedicine um, uh, as we go forward. And then there's agri-foods and agri-entrepreneurship. Um, there's tremendous growth in agri-tech and agri-entrepreneurship areas and food import replacement, which is I prefer, I think that I use this term as opposed to import substitution, right? Import replacement means that, for example, yeah, you're replacing wheat. So we, the Caribbean imports a lot of wheat bread and a lot of white bread which we consume, which is really bad for our health. In fact, it's a major contributor to our deteriorating um, chronic um, disease profile. Why not cassava? Why not sweet potato? These are all forms that could be converted into flour and made into bread, support employment, foreign exchange earnings, and so on. But all this has to be done now within climate smart agriculture and tap into things like superfoods, like cassava, like um, Simons here in, in St. Lucia, which is a growth industry. And last but not least, the digital economy and FinTech. And I put FinTech in there because in many respects, all of the new modes of, um, of engaging in the global economy require you to be interfacing with the ICTs and telecoms. Um, digital education, which we talked about in one of the presentations, is a growth area which we need to tap into. Um, Creative economy, which is one of my core areas of research, is a, a, a significant growth area. Plus cyber tech and security areas uh, are huge um, potential areas. So the question then arises then, if these are the growth picks, um, where are the support infrastructure? Where are the institutions and so forth to take advantage of these opportunities? So at my college, for example, we've ramped up our um, digital education area. We have an e-learning academy, which we've established in the last six or seven months. Um, and we're moving steadfastly in that area. Um, and we are boost, 